Okay, this is okay. This is solar cooking experiment number two. I did I did an experiment quite some time ago, but I didn't have the battery power that I needed in order to cook. But I just just purchased this Duracell 100 amp hour battery. It's an AGM battery. It's made by Deca Batteries, which is a very good brand. I got it at Sam's Club for 166 dollars. I have it connected through these six gauge battery cables directly to my inverter. These should probably be a little bigger, but they'll be fine for this application, I think. I've got it connected to my Pro Watt sine wave. This is a this is a true sine wave inverter. It's not a modified square wave inverter. I've got that plugged in to my rival crock pot, which I'm going to cook on high. Now, originally when I did this, I used these power packs in parallel. Okay, and I couldn't get the power that I wanted. These are charged by my 60 watt array that's up on the deck. So the power from the 60 watt array comes down through this cable, goes down through here, it goes through my charge controller, which you can see is working right now. It's charging these batteries and into here. And then that is what I try to use this inverter here to cook before it didn't quite work. Now I think with this setup here I'm going to get four hours of cook time and I'll explain my math here in a minute. I've got my voltage meter so I can measure between this point and this point and that's going to tell me if I have a voltage drop. That's going to tell me if the cables I'm using are big enough which I think they will be for this application. But let me go over the math on why I think this will work. Okay, so here's the math. How much, how do I figure out how much current my battery needs to supply and how long it will supply it for cooking? Okay, so I use the formula, simple formula, P equals IV. That means power equals current times voltage. Now I measured this rival crock pot before at 210 watts. That's what it puts out, or that's what it uses on high. I used a watt meter to determine that. Now, so to get the current on the output of the inverter, that means the part that provides the 120 volts, it might provide 110, which will change our, our, our uh, formulas a little bit, but I'm not going to worry about it. So I took 210 watts and I divided by 120 and I get 1.75 amps. Now, that's that's what you know I think it gets, but there's some there's some inefficiency in this inverter, and I'm gonna say it's 90% efficient. So what I'm gonna do to account for that inefficiency is I'm gonna divide that number by 0.9. Stupid calculator. So that gives me 1.94 amps. Hopefully you can see that. That's from the power cord on the inverter to the crock pot. That's how much current it's putting out. So now we have to determine how much the battery is going to need to supply. So to do that, we need to multiply, I'm just going to call this 2 amps to make it simple. I'm going to multiply that by 10 and I'll explain that in a minute. So I get 20 amps. That is what the battery is going to need to source to my inverter to get the 210 watts out. Okay, now why did I do that? Let me step over here. Hopefully you can still see me. Anytime, okay, so the power into a transformer equals the power out. So the way it steps up this voltage from the 12 volts to the 120 is it's got a switcher in there. Okay, so it takes the DC voltage and it pulses it. And it pulses it to make it AC. And the reason it does that is so I can step it up. So the way a transformer works, I'm just going to draw a couple coils here, is it steps it up by having more turns on the output side than it has on the input side. And those are given in ratios like 1 to 10, 1 to 12, whatever. In this case, it's 1 to 10, obviously, because you want to go from 12 volts up to 120. So that means I have one turn on this side for every 10 turns on this side. Now, I show like one turn here, or two turns here, whatever, but it's supposed to be one turn, excuse me. And there's supposed to be 10 over here. That's not really what it looks like. There's not really one turn of wire here and 10 over here. There might be 100 turns here and 1,000 turns here. But anyway, it doesn't matter. The ratio stays the same. 
So I take my 12 volts here and I multiply it by 10 and I get my 120 volts over here. But see when it does that, power in is equal to power out. So when it steps up the voltage, that means it has to step down the current at the same ratio. So when I step up the voltage times 10, I've got to divide the current by 10. Okay, so let's say it provides 10 amps here, it's going to provide 1 amp here on the 120 side. Now, so to determine how much, how much energy my battery needs to supply, I need to look back this way. So I know I've got 120 volts here at, I said I just made it 2 amps. So that means when I look back through here and I get back to the 12 volts, I've got, a, I've got to multiply my current times 10. So I set this down from 120 to 12. And that means I got to, since I set this down, I've got to multiply 2 amps times 10. So I get my 20 amps over here. Hopefully that's clear to you. Sorry if it's not. Now, so that means that I've got 20 amps that my battery has to supply to get the 210 watts on the output side of that inverter. So, how much, how long can this cook? Well, this is a 100 amp hour battery, okay? So they say typically you only want to run it down really to 80% of the capacity. You really like to only run it down to 50, but that's all I have. So how many times will 100, excuse me, will, will 20 go into 80, okay? Okay, so 20 amps divides into 80 amps four times. So I think that I've got four hours of cook time on this battery. So we'll see in actuality what I have. I hope I made that clear. I'm sorry if I didn't. If anybody has any questions, they can let me know. Anyway, I'm going to go up and I'm going to try to cook a full chicken in this, in this uh, crock pot. I'll show you what I have when I'm left. Hopefully this works. Okay, there is something I forgot to mention um, in talking about cook times here. I did my estimates conservatively, um, thinking or, let's see, saying that, going by the assumption, excuse me, that this is going to need to provide a constant 210 watts to the uh, crock pot. But in reality, that's not really what happens. This device, this crock pot has something in there called an infinity switch. And the way that works is this, and I'll explain why it works like that. But anyway, it's got a metallic contact, okay? I don't know what metal it's made out of, I can't remember. So it's designed like this. It makes contact, and it provides the 210 watts. And as it's providing that current, this infinity switch heats up. And when it gets a certain temperature, it goes like this, it opens. Now that cuts current to the heating element, okay? And then that, that contact cools down, cools down, cools down over some time, and it makes contact again. And then it gets, gets the current it needs for 210 watts. And that contact heats up at an infinity switch, and it goes like this. So what it really does is it keeps the chamber at a certain temperature. It does that not with a thermostat control, but with this infinity switch that only provides a certain amount of time. I guess the manufacturer has measured what they need to keep the chamber at a certain temperature. And that, that keeps the chamber from getting too hot, it keeps the crock pot from burning up, and the crock pot from getting too hot. So, in reality, I'm not going to need to send 210 watts to the crock pot the entire time. I don't know if it's 20% of the time, 80% of the time, 90% of the time. I have no idea, but I may get more cook time out of this just because I'm not sending 210 watts to the crock pot at all times. So I may get less. You know, maybe my connection scheme isn't as good. Maybe my battery's not as good as I think, even though it's brand new. That's why we experiment, right? So here we go. Okay, and there we go. There's my chicken in there. I've got some basil in there, some carrots, some celery, salt, pepper, um, garlic powder, onion powder, and some chicken bouillon. So there it is. It was still slightly frozen. 
And there's my inverter. It says currently it's off and it says 12.9 volts. So once I turn this guy on, we'll see how low that dips. Now if this if this says less than this when I measure across there, that means I get a voltage drop across there. And I'll tell you how I can figure that out. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this on high. Wish me luck. So it's on. And the battery dipped down to 12.6 volts. And give me a minute and I'll measure the battery itself. And I'll measure from here to here. And we'll see what we get. Okay. Actually, after a minute, the display on the Xantrex inverter read 12.3. So that makes me wonder how much voltage I'm losing in here. So I'm going to measure it. Let's see what the battery says. So I've got my voltmeter on DC volts. And from here to here, I've got 12.36 volts. So I don't think I have much drop, but I'm going to measure it. So that makes me wonder how good this battery is. I don't really know how low it's supposed to dip when I turn it on. This is a pretty big battery. So it kind of surprised me it dips down that low. Uh, we'll see how much cook time I get. I don't know if that's normal. I may have to take the battery back. We'll see. My charger might have malfunctioned. I bought this new charger for, hopefully it didn't register the battery. Okay, so I don't have much of a drop here between here and here. I've got 33 millivolts. So that tells me that I'm not really concerned about my connection scheme here. I measured, this measured 12.3, this measured 12.36. What did I say I measured? 33 millivolts, that's 0.034 volts between here and here. That's not too bad, I don't think. So I guess at this point, it's just how good is the battery. And uh, like I said, I don't know the health of the battery and I bought a new charger for it, a Schumacher. So the Schumacher is supposed to go into low voltage mode after the battery is charged. It didn't seem to do that. So hopefully I didn't ever cook the battery. It's one of these automatic chargers. I'm kind of rambling on here, but uh, I guess I'm telling you my fears. Anyway, we'll see how much cook time I get before the alarm goes off on the Xantrax. And if it goes off, that means i got to take that battery back. It is 1.25 right now, so I started my cooking process. So we'll see what we get out of this battery. Okay, while I am cooking that, I'm going to go over some things. I've thought about how far those batteries or that battery dipped down when I turned it on. I guess that's probably normal. The trick is, or the key is, to see it is currently at 12.4 volts. I guess it is drawing 20 amps from the battery. That's a pretty good draw. So I guess dropping down from 12.75 or 12.8, whatever it was, to 12.4 is, is okay. The, the trick is, or the key is, or the question is, will it stay at that 12.4 volts for three or four hours? And if it does, it'll be fine. It'll provide enough current. But I just want to go over some things about charging batteries. Now, I have a 60-watt array on the porch. Connected to that 60-watt array, I have, I have two batteries of unequal size in parallel. So I get 47 amp hours out of the both of them. If the batteries are in good shape and this, that, and the other. I'm supposed to get somewhere, if I divide, how much, so how much current am I getting from my solar panels? So if I just say they're 12 volt panels, they go up to 15 or something. So if I just take 60, which is my wattage, divided by, I just, arbitrarily took a voltage of 15, I get 4 amps of current. That's what those solar panels, that 60 watt array, is supposed to be providing. If you take it by 12, you get something like 5 amps. So, 
how quickly can I charge the batteries I have, these two power packs? Well, you take 47, which is the amp hour of the battery, and you take the current that you're providing, or should be providing, 4 amps. So, if I take my amp hours, my total amp hours of my battery, and I divide by the current that I should be providing from the solar array, I get 11.75. That's hours. So that tells me approximately that I should be able to recharge those two power packs if they're completely dead, which they never will be, in 11.75 hours of sun. I'd like them to charge faster, but that's what I have. Now I cannot charge that 100 amp hour battery from that 60 watt array. I got the battery and I'm going to keep it topped off from that array for emergencies. But to charge that 100 amp hour battery in a full day, let's see what I need. So I take my 100 amp hour battery, and let's say I want to charge it in 10 hours, okay? So I just divide by 10, right? So that gives me 10 hours. So that tells me that I need to provide, if I want to recharge that battery, that big battery, in 10 hours, I need to provide 10 amps of current, okay? So how much power do I need to provide 10 amps of current? I don't know. So what is, I want to charge the battery to 12 volts, right? And I want to provide 10 amps of current. So if I take 10 and I multiply it by 12, I get 120 watts. So I need at least a 120 watt array to charge that big 100 amp hour battery in 10 hours. Now preferably, I'd like to charge it in less time than that. So, let's say I want to charge it in half that time. Let's say I want a 240 watt array. Of course, 120 provides 10 amps. If I want to, if I want to do 20 amps, 240, right? So take 240, and I divide by, I guess I'm breaking the rules here, but let's just say 15. Let's see what kind of current I get. Now this is an ideal solar array. Hopefully this is coming through. There's no rehearsal here, so I'm just kind of doing this stuff out of my head. Hopefully this is helpful. So if I take 240 watts, and I divide by 15 volts, which I'm thinking is a typical voltage under full sun, I get 16 amps. So that tells me under ideal conditions, with my 240 watt array, if it is providing 15 volts, I get 16 amps. So how fast can I charge my 100 amp hour battery? So I'm gonna take 100, and I'm gonna divide by the amperage, which is 16, Excuse me, I'm using my uh, telephone here as my calculator because I couldn't find batteries. And I am not that slick, so I can't do that in my head. So if I divide 100 by 16, I get 6.25, 6.25, wherever that is, hours. So if I'm providing 16 amps of current, that means I can recharge that huge battery in 6.25 hours, which would be good. So, let's say I want a 240 watt array. I'll eventually put it up there and I can recharge that battery every day in 6.25 hours. If this works, I could cook a meal in the crock pot, that's a full chicken, in a day. I could replace the power in a day. I could replace the power during the day, cook at night, replace the power the next day. Of course, you know, if I provided 32 amps, I could cook and recharge batteries at the same time. But anyway, hopefully that's helpful. I'm pulling that stuff out of my head. There's no rehearsal, so hopefully you find that useful. Okay, and just for completeness sake, I wanted to show you my little array I have. These are amorphous panels. Got about $300 invested in this system with the charge controller. 
so I bought these slowly over time these are the cheapest kind of panels you can get they're amorphous they're made in China I haven't measured them in a long time so I don't know how they're working but my batteries stay charged but anyway I found a 260 watt array on Costco $200 off with the charge controller for about $700 so that with that $700 I've already got the batteries I could replenish the battery energy and cook with it every single day okay I did this video yesterday but in watching it today I realized I made a mistake in a point I was trying to explain so, there's some formula to determine as a battery discharges what the voltage drops to on a healthy battery. You use uh, current flow and electrons and stuff like that. I can't remember that formula, but I want to show you another point, which is actually pretty important and more practical. Okay, and it's about internal resistances of a battery. So I'm going to draw my battery here, which consists of a DC power supply, but there's also an internal resistance in any battery. It's usually very low, 0, 0.00 something. So, I've got my 12 volts here. This is my 12 volt supply, and this is my internal resistance of the battery. So I'm going to call this R in. I'll assign a value to that later, okay? So this dotted rectangle This indicates my entire battery. So I'm going to call this a 12 volt battery. So this is my battery. This is my negative terminal. This is my positive terminal. Okay. Now when the battery's just sitting by itself, it's not connected to anything, and you measure the voltage, what you're really measuring is right here, like this. This is my voltmeter. This circuit represents my voltmeter. And you're going to measure the full 12 volts here. There is probably 2 to 5 megohms of resistance in that meter. They make it like that so that you can really measure an open circuit voltage. This 2 to, two, two to 5 megohms is much higher than the internal resistance of the battery. But that doesn't matter. What does matter is you get very little current flow in, through here. So it's, it's like an open. So you get the full volt voltage measured from here to here. Now as you use a battery, that becomes a different story. So I'm going to connect my battery in a circuit. This, there's some work being done over here to the right, right here. I'm going to call this RL, that's my load resistance. Now, let's say when you first start out, you get 60 watts of power right here. Okay, that's what you start with. That's what, it, what you're getting when you first hook the battery up. You're getting 60 watts. So what's my current through here if I'm getting 60 watts right here? Okay. So to get that, I'm going to use, to get my current, I'm going to use this formula, P equals IV. That means power equals current times voltage. So what's my power? My power I'm getting is 60 watts. What voltage am I getting? Well, when I first hook the battery up, I measure across here and I'm getting a full 12 volts. So that's my 12. So it means my I is the unknown variable. So to get my current, I'm going to take my 60 and I'm going to divide it. I'm going to put it on this side of the equation and I'm going to divide by 12. Okay? which is my voltage. So my power divided by my voltage. And I'm getting my current. So if I'm pr producing 60 watts there, and I know my voltage is 12, I'm getting 5 amps of current through here. Okay, so that means it comes out of the negative terminal. It travels up through this load resistor and then back into the positive terminal of the battery. So I'm getting a nice 60 watts there, I'm getting 5 amps. Well, what's my resistance here in my load if I'm getting 60 watts there? And I know my, my voltage is 12 and I know I've got 5 amps. Well, to get my resistance, 
total resistance actually. I can use another formula. Okay, so that says V divided by I equals R. Voltage divided by current equals the resistance. So I'm going to take my 12 and I'm going to divide that by 5 amps. It's about resistance. I'm just going to call that resistance or R. So that says total resistance in this whole circuit, I'm going to call that R tope equals 2.4 ohms. Now I'm going to assume this battery is in great shape. Okay, this is an ideal battery, so I've got a very low internal resistance. It doesn't come into play at all when I first hook it up. So that tells me that I've got 2.4 ohms and my load resistance because the battery's acting perfectly, internal resistance is negligible, you don't even, it doesn't even come into play, okay? But what happens with a battery, especially if it's bad, is that as you use the battery, the internal resistance goes up, okay? So here's my box. This is resistance on this axis. This is time. Hopefully you can see that. So our internal goes up as time continues and as it uses current in a battery that's uh, it's not in the best shape. So let's say after some time My, my internal resistance on my battery goes up to 5 ohms. I already know this is 2.4 ohms, so what's the current after the battery heats up and my internal resistance goes high? Well, to get that, I'm going to take... I, I'm going to take 5, which is our internal, plus my known resistance, which is 2.4 ohms, and I'm going to get a total resistance of 7.4 ohms. Now, 12 volts is being supplied by the internal power supply of the battery. It's going through the load resistor, through the, excuse me, through the internal resistance, through the load resistor, and back, okay? So I've now got 7.4 ohms, excuse me. <laughs> 7.4 ohms total resistance. So what's my current drop to? So I'm going to take 12 divided by 7.4 ohms. Because I know it was a 12 volt battery to start with. 12 divided by 7.4. Now, because this internal resistance has gone up, I'm only getting 1.6 amps of current. So I get less power here just from that, but it's even more complicated than that. So, how much of the voltage supplied by this source here internal in the battery is dropped across the internal resistance of the battery and how much is dropped across the load. Well, we can figure that out, okay? So to find out what percentage this is of the total, I'm going to take 5 ohms and I'm going to divide that by the total resistance, which I just said, which is 7.4 ohms. And that's going to give me a ratio, okay? So 5 divided by 7.4 equals 0.675, okay? Now, if I want to know what that in a percentage, of course, I'm going to multiply that by 100. 0.675, okay? So, 67.5% of my total voltage supplied by the source internal of the battery is dropped across the internal resistance of the battery. So, that means that 8... 0 0.10 volts is dropped across the internal resistance of the battery before you even see it. So what's left? 12 minus 8.10. That means if I took a voltmeter and I put it right here, I would only get 3.89 volts. Okay, so now I'm only seeing 3.89 volts to my load. 
okay? So I said I've got 1.6 amps traveling through the circuit now because I took my total resistance and I divide that into my known voltage, which was 12, which is what I started with, okay? So how much power am I getting to my load now? I started with 60 watts times 1.6. Okay, so I took my voltage that I measured times my current that I calculated, and I get 6. Okay, sorry about that. My camera just died. So, I calculated that I've got 1.6 amps through there. I said that 8.10 volts of the total 12 volts is dropped internally in the battery. You only see 3.89 volts. Whew. Sorry, I had already calculated that I got 1.6 amps through the circuit. So what's my power in my load? I started with, with 60 watts. But the battery's in bad shape, so our internal jumps up real high to 5 ohms. So what am I getting at my load now? So I multiply my 3.89 volts, which is what I measure with my voltmeter, times my 1.6 amps, and I get 6.22 watts of power across my load resistance. That's the only amount of work that's being done. So now, I get only 6.22. 2, 2 watts. So I get 10 times less power because my battery's not in good shape and it's only delivering 6.22 watts. Most of the voltage supplied by the internal power source of the battery is dropped inside the battery across the internal resistance which means you only see 3.89 volts when you measure here. This is a bad battery. So that is why internal resistances become important. Now, only in bad batteries do you see voltage, or excuse me, resistances this high that you can calculate. In, in reality, in a good battery, like I said, or maybe I didn't, you might get 0 .0001 ohms of resistance or something like that, so that that never really becomes a factor. Anyway, I want to kind of go over health of battery and why it's important to have a healthy battery and resistances and how they go up and how they affect the circuit. Now, in a bad battery, why would you get resistances that go up so high? Well, maybe the plates in the battery start to corrode so that when they try to source current, they heat up and then that corrosion acts like an insulator so you can't get current flow through there, so your resistance goes up. Perhaps you've heard of sulfation, which is what happens when a battery, when you let it discharge and just leave it set, it starts to sulfate on the plates it builds up a little, this is a plate, it builds up a little insulation layer of corrosion and sulfation. So that you can't get current flow, this is an insulator, through the plates, through this insulation. So the internal resistance of the battery goes through the roof. So anyway, that's my explanation of internal resistances and how they affect performance of a battery. Hope you find that useful. Okay, so after that, I just measured, I'm at the two hour mark, this, this chicken here has been cooking for two hours. So I measured the voltage, we started with 12.4 volts working voltage as it's supplying current. An hour later I measured 12.2, or excuse me, the Xantrax read 12.2 volts working. We're now at the two hour mark and I've got an even 12 volts working. The meter, the the inverter here has an alarm that comes on, or goes off, and I think it shuts off. At 11 volts. So, we'll see if uh, we can cook this before it gets there. Just FYI, I've got some numbers that I looked up online for the open circuit voltage of a battery versus charge. So, doesn't quite come into play here because we're using it, but it kind of gives us something to go on. When a battery is 100% charged, your open circuit voltage will be 12.7 volts. In reality, sometimes you have some problems with some batteries, and even though you might read 12.7 volts, 
it's not really holding the capacity it should. So when you go to hook it up, the voltage will dip down really low. That internal resistance will become come into play because as a battery gets used and worn out, that internal resistance goes way up. So it no longer starts low and works its way up. It's, it starts pretty high. That's, that's regardless. Now, at the 50% mark, this is open, open circuit voltage. At the 50% mark, we would read 12.06 volts. Open circuit. At the 10% mark, if we were to measure this battery, we would read 11.3 volts. So they made an alarm and they made it so this device shuts off at 11 volts. So hopefully we get some more cook time. Between you and me, if I get another hour of cook time, I'll be happy. I'd like the four. We'll see. If I get four, I'm going to be very pleased with this battery. But anyway, those are some things for you to uh, chew on, to go on. Okay, there is something I want to correct. I said the inverter shuts off at 11 volts. That, that is not correct. I just read in the manual. It actually just gives an alarm. 11 volts. It actually shuts down at 10.5 volts, which is good. So, just want to correct. Okay, while we're waiting for our chicken dinner to get ready, I want to show you some things. It's starting to smell like dinner. It smells good. But anyway, I want to show you this. Let's say you cook this chicken that I'm cooking here in a typical oven. Um, I can guesstimate a typical oven is about 4,500 watts. That's probably at least. So you're gonna you're gonna cook it in an hour, let's just say. We're going to use power. We're not going to use energy. Okay? So you can either use 4,500 watts of power for one hour, 4,500 watts, or you can cook it in a crock pot. Okay? Now, I said I measured 210 watts with my power meter. It's, it says I'm using, my Xantrex says 170 watts. We'll just use 200. So for the crock pot, I'm using 200 watts an hour. So I, cooked, I can cook the chicken for one hour at 4,500 watts, but I'm not cooking this for an hour. I'm cooking it for five hours. So let's use power. So at the end of five hours, how much power have I used? Well, 200 times five, of course, is 1,000. So I can either cook this in five hours using 1,000 watts of power, or I can cook the chicken in one hour using 4,500 watts. Ovens, your standard oven is extremely inefficient. If you think about it, wouldn't it be nice if you could cook it in an hour with 1,000 watts or cook it in five hours using 200 watts an hour? Doesn't that make sense? But your oven is extremely inefficient. So when you start to do stuff with batteries, you have to start to think about how much power it takes to do everything. When you're doing solar, you don't think of it in terms of energy. You, you typically do current and amps. So when you do solar, you have to start thinking about how much energy or how much power it takes to cook things. So look at the difference. This is in my stove in my house, 4,500 watts for one hour, or using a battery off of the solar, which, you know, eventually I'll be able to charge it. 200 watts times 5 hours equals 1,000 watts. So this uses, even though this takes 5 hours of time, it uses significantly less power than my regular oven. I just want to show you that real quickly. Okay, I am 15 minutes shy of my 5 hour mark. I believe this uh, inverter is about to alarm. It says 11 volts. So I'm going to let it cook. Hopefully it'll get to five hours. This tells me my battery, my new battery is in good shape. So that's great. Um, my conservative estimates were a little off, but that's okay. As long as 
you're conservative and you get more battery time. Now the reason it might be off is because I originally said that it uses 210 watts on high, the uh, crock pot that is, and I'm reading from the Xantrax 170 watts. So, also I said 80% of the battery depleted, so there's no telling what we're doing here. Now remember, this 11 volts is under load. So, once I disconnect this and measure the, the battery voltage, I'll be able to get an idea of what the battery is depleted to, but I'm going to let it cook for a while. I want it to cook to at least five, five hours. Now, I just checked the FDA uh, Safe Temp for Chicken, their website, and they say you want to cook chicken to an internal temperature of 165 degrees Fahrenheit. So, as long as I cook it to that, um, it should be safe. So I'm very pleased so far. I'm pleased with my new battery and I'm pleased with the setup and it looks like everything's working great. Okay, I looked it up and 11.4 volts is about 20%. So that's right, about 80 amp hours need to be recharged. So to figure that out, you divide 80 by 15 amps. And I think it's about it's about five hours. Excuse me a minute. Okay. Here it goes. Mm -hmm. That's good. It's good. It's tender. It's not dry. It's delicious. Um, it's well cooked. So there you have it.